And the Pentagon has opened a new office to investigate UFOs called All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. What do you think about this office? Do you think it can help alleviate in the, in the way which this hearing perhaps has failed to improve more the scientific rigor and the seriousness of investigating UFOs? I think that remains to be seen. I think it's a step in the right direction, but it's a step that was taken because the previous step didn't happen, <laughs> right? So um, the AOI MSG was the progeny essentially of the AARO or ARO. And you know the name was changed because nothing was happening and it was essentially just a confusing mess of words that were created to make this topic unpalatable. Um, the Airborne Object Identification Synchronization Management Group. <laughs> Quite the mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, I practice that. Uh, but the new <laughs> all-domain anomaly resolution office, you know, from my perspective, at least, at least the perspective that they're putting out, they they seem to want to be open. They put out uh, a Twitter handle. They're out, they're going out on Twitter and communicating, saying they want to keep this open. Um, but you know, that's going to run into a classification wall. Well, so uh, Doctor Sean Kirkpatrick is, seems like an interesting guy. He does. Yes. <laughs> so he he's got a. Um, Evan looked in too deeply, but he, he seems to have sort of, he's coming from like a science research perspective, like a uh, uh, background. Mm -hmm. So he, he might be at least in the right um, mindset, the right background to kind of lead a serious investigation. I think so. I'll just say generally, um, you know, the office has been receptive to AI delay reaching out in order to collaborate. Uh, which has been uh, a positive sign. Um, I'll also pass the same kudos to um, Dr. Spurgel and NASA's uh, effort as well. I, I, I see these organizations that are standing up. I, I do see them as as good faith efforts that are coming about through a lot of difficulty and negotiation, most likely, right? And I see these as, as a small uh, door opening that if we can take advantage of can lead to uh, a much more productive relationship between these organizations. How do you put pressure on this kind of thing? Does it come from the civilian leadership? Does it come from sort of Congress and presidents? Does it come from the public? Does the public have any power to put pressure on this? Or is the the, the giant wall of bureaucracy going to protect it against any public pressure? What do you think? I think we've been in, in that latter state for a while, but you know, society seems to be a bit different nowadays. You know, we have the ability to communicate and to group and to to form relationships in a way that hadn't been able to be present in the past. We've been able to do research for better or worse on our own, you know, in a way that hasn't been able to happen before. And so I sense that people are a bit less willing to kind of buy the bottom line statement from those in power as they used to be back when they didn't have access to those tools. And so I do think there is a massive role for the general society, general populace to play to show that they are interested in this. Because it's not that I don't think the politicians or the leaders in the in the Pentagon, it's not that they don't like this topic necessarily or think it's toxic per se, but they exist in a culture where this has been toxic and they don't feel comfortable talking about it. And these are people that have spent their entire careers, you know, working towards a goal and getting to very high positions within government. And so this is very against their nature to take a stance on a topic like this. Um, and so the fact that these are standing up, even if they do have a small budget or if they struggled a bit at first, I still think it's a massive change, you know, and it's a big step away from that stigma that has been pervading this topic for so long. And you're actually part of alleviating the stigma for some somebody that's as credible, as intelligent, as like varied in background, able to speak about these things. That's a big risk that you took, but it's extremely valuable because it's uh, alleviating the stigma. I thank you for saying that, but it didn't feel like much of a risk for me. Uh, you know, I didn't come out about aliens, right? I, or whatever. I, I had a safety problem that I started asking questions about. And, you know, I went down a road as a Navy trained aviation safety officer, right? That sent me to school for six weeks in Pensacola to be a safety officer. You know, we're almost hitting these objects and it's not something that happened in the past and we want to understand it. It's happening right now. Like yeah. these, these occurrences are still happening. Aviators are flying right now, are still flying by these things. And in fact, um, I mentioned I was a instructor pilot. Um, I had a student call me uh, about eight months ago or so. And he's like, hey, sir, you know, I made it to the fleet finally. 
you know, I had trained him how to fly. And then he goes to F-18, he goes another year of training, and then he gets out to his squadron on the East Coast. And he's flying with a senior member of uh, the base, NAS Oceana, where the fighters fly out of um, senior 05 or 06. And it was kind of a bad weather day. And so they said, hey, you know, if the weather's not good enough for us to do this dogfighting set, we'll, we'll go out and do a, a UAP hunt, you know, see if we can't find any things or take a look at them, you know. I don't know if it was in jest or not, but, you know, this, they, I actually would say it's not in jest because there were, there were notices that were being briefed about this being a safety hazard at this point. And so I, now that I, I think about it, it likely wasn't in jest. Long story short, they went flying. The weather was too bad. They did go on a UFO hunt and they physically saw one. You know, and he called me up and said, like, hey, sir, I saw a cube and a spear. They're still out here, you know, years later. And so it's almost like a generational issue, you know, for these fighter pilots, at least on the East Coast. But that's great that they can talk about it, right? Exactly. Exactly. They feel at least comfortable. They have a reporting mechanism. And so that was one of the problems that I noticed that we have a lot of reporting mechanisms to take care of safety issues and, and even tactical issues when the time's right in order to keep track of what's going on. But there's no way to communicate about this. Um, sure, we could submit a hazard report, but nothing's actually being investigated. Um, and if this is a tactical vulnerability or, or something more, it deserves attention. 